welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. We are well into 2020, and the work continues. Let's take a look back at what happened in February. Our annual conference series, Ending Age-Related Diseases, Investment Prospects and Advances in Research, will continue for its third year. The event will be hosted at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City on August 20th and 21st, and will feature researchers at the forefront of rejuvenation biotechnology. We hope to see you there. Our blog website, leafscience.org, and our fundraising and advocacy site, lifespan.io, have merged into a single longevity hub. All of our blog content will continue to be posted on lifespan.io. New articles available on this site include one on the role of public advocacy in life extension science, and one on the steps people should take, including college courses and self-study, in order to directly get involved in the field of rejuvenation biotechnology. Also on our website is February's Journal Club, which features host Dr. Oliver Medvedic diving into a recent paper that explored using gamma stimulation, accomplished through visual and auditory stimuli, to treat Alzheimer's disease. On a new episode of our Life Extend show, Vera tackles the belief that life extension will be only for the rich. This is a concern that I often hear being expressed, and I do think this is a very important video, and Vera makes some great points. Here are some of them. Will rejuvenation biotechnologies be affordable and easily accessible to all? Or will they become a privilege for the rich? This is a legitimate concern, though more often than not, it escalates into a backward rage-driven holy war against the rich and their privileges, which equally often ends with the conclusion that rejuvenation is a bad idea because, let's face it, it would of course be only for the rich. Yes, it would suck if only the rich had access to rejuvenation therapies, but that's only because the suckiness happens at a more general level. It would suck if only some people had access to rejuvenation therapies, whatever the size of their bank account. Somebody's been screwed over, and that's the problem. Besides, even if at the beginning only some people will benefit from rejuvenation, some is still better than none. Just because not everyone can have it, it doesn't mean no one should. If we had a miracle cure for cancer on the drawing board, but it turned out to be ridiculously expensive, what should we do? Ban it to prevent inequality of access and screw everyone over? Or have it developed and then do our best to ensure the widest possible access as soon as possible? But for the sake of the argument, say that we decided to ban rejuvenation before it was even created to prevent any inequality of access from happening. Who would stand to gain from this? Well, whether rejuvenation were developed or not would change nothing for those who couldn't afford it anyway. Their net benefit is zero in either scenario. Unless they're happy to know that if they can't have rejuvenation, then nobody will. Also, if it's extremely poor people we're talking about, they're probably too busy trying to survive to indulge in schadenfreude. So we can cross out the poor from the list of the beneficiaries of the non-existence of rejuvenation. Filthy rich people might not be forever young, but they'd still lead far more comfortable and very possibly longer lives than the rest of the world. So all they'd lose is a potential benefit, which incidentally everyone else loses in the process as well. Because if rejuvenation did exist, everyone would have better chances of getting it one day than they would if it didn't. The elderly would be royally screwed and discriminated against, because opposing rejuvenation therapies equals opposing therapies capable of actually curing and preventing age-related diseases, and keeping older people fully healthy. Meanwhile, those who opposed rejuvenation on social justice grounds may well feel like they helped the poor, even though they didn't. 
and it didn't cost them anything but the effort of raging against something, which people very much enjoy doing these days. Also, they don't have to worry that rejuvenation might ever be added to the list of things they have to feel guilty about compared to the poor. If anyone stands to gain anything from the non-existence of rejuvenation, it's these guys, and their feelings don't outweigh the suffering of billions of people. In short, banning rejuvenation would prevent inequality of access if the price tag were too steep, but it would also hang everyone out to dry, so at this point, it might be worth looking into whether the price tag would be that steep. The bad news is, it may well be. Like all pioneering technology, rejuvenation therapies are likely to cost an arm and a leg at the beginning. It's hard to predict how much, but this is to be expected. And the reason is not that Big Pharma is evil and wants to milk every last cent out of you. Drug development is ridiculously expensive and has an abysmal rate of success. A potential new drug needs to go through different phases of clinical trials, each costing millions of dollars, and it may easily fail during any of them. According to a 2016 study, developing a single new drug from the ground up, getting it through trials, approved, and finally onto the market, may cost up to $2.8 billion. Different studies report different figures, but the grand total is always in the billions range. Roughly one out of every 10 candidate drugs actually makes it past that trial process and to patients. And given that a pharma company generally works on many drugs at the same time, most of the money they spend is thrown out of the window, never to return. The losses are especially bad when a drug fails in later phases of the trials because they're more expensive and because the company has already spent tons of money on the previous phases. Arguably, the more complex the drug, the higher the development costs. So drugs that literally rejuvenate people are probably going to be a touch pricey at first. Still, already now several companies are working on specific rejuvenation therapies and competition usually leads to lower prices and drives further innovation that allows to produce more effective drugs at a lower cost. On top of that, when drugs go off patent, other companies are free to create their own versions of the original drug, and they generally wind up being cheaper. Again, timeframes cannot be reliably predicted, but it's unlikely that rejuvenation treatments, or any treatment for that matter, would be super expensive forever. In any case, health insurance, or governments through socialized healthcare, might pay to rejuvenate people. In most countries of the world, around 70-100% to of the population is covered by either health insurance or free government healthcare, and they already pay for geriatric treatments that aren't really effective. It might be in their best interest to pay for medicine that actually works and keeps people healthy, so that their medical expenses are mostly limited to rejuvenation itself. People working in companies often have health insurance paid by their employers, and the goal of rejuvenation wouldn't be any different from any other medical expense that employers are paying for already. Keeping their employees in good health and fit for work. Also, a rejuvenated citizen can work and pay taxes for longer, and doesn't have to be paid a pension until death which may be another incentive for governments to step in. Regardless of all this, the problem of inequality of access wouldn't exist for rejuvenation or anything else if there wasn't such a large divide between rich and poor to begin with. And actually, we're getting there. For starters, there aren't just rich and poor in the world. Wealth is a spectrum, and there are different degrees of poverty and richness. The difference between the poorest poor and the richest rich is huge, but most people of the world lie in between them. And as a matter of fact, world poverty has been falling dramatically since 1970s. In the last 30 years alone, the number of people living in extreme poverty was reduced by nearly three quarters, reaching an all-time low of 650 million in 2018. Granted, that's still a lot of people, 
but it's a lot less than the 1.9 billion people living in extreme poverty in 1990. It's also true that extreme poverty is such for a reason. It means living on less than $2 a day. And there are still richer poor people having a real hard time making ends meet. The World Bank has a stated goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030. And while that might be a bit too optimistic, projections indicate that we will get close. Less than 5% of the world population is expected to live in extreme poverty by then. There is definitely hope that one day relatively soon, being too poor to afford basic needs won't really be a thing anymore. And affording medical treatment, rejuvenation or others may not be such a problem. It may be obvious, but just reducing the divide between rich and poor isn't all. The way we do it matters a lot. For example, if the rich became poorer, while those who already were poor stayed just as poor as they were, the gap between them would get smaller, but the situation wouldn't be any better, because we'd have more poor people than we started with. Of course, if you took from the rich and gave to the poor Robin Hood style, you might close the gap, but you might also end up causing political strife and damaging the economy. The pie would stay the same, and all you'd be changing is how it's sliced. However, human progress is all about making the pie larger by coming up with more and more clever ways to create abundance, so that even if the slicing is uneven, everyone gets more than enough. Not creating rejuvenation wouldn't make the divide between rich and poor any larger, but it wouldn't make the pie any larger either, and no one would be better off. We've also released another episode of the Life Extend show in our ongoing series on the hallmarks of aging, this time on the topic of loss of proteostasis. Find these episodes and more on our website. And now for a research roundup. A new study published in M Systems, a journal for the American Society for Microbiology, shows that the skin and mouth microbiomes are better predictors of age than the gut microbiome. The study was done with nearly 9,000 people in total, which the team said made it the most comprehensive microbiome study to date. According to their results, the skin microbiome provides the best prediction of age. This is good news for medical professionals and patients, as it is much more convenient to take skin and saliva samples than fecal samples. Synapses in the brain are preserved by transplanting young bone marrow into older individuals, according to an open-access mouse study published in Communications Biology. The study concluded that young blood or bone marrow may represent a future therapeutic strategy for neurodegenerative disease. While this was a mouse study, marrow transplants are already being performed in humans, so one next logical step could be to test cognition in people who have received them. An international team of researchers has discovered that the powerhouses of our cells, the mitochondria, can communicate with the nucleus to trigger cells to enter senescence. This finding builds on the increasing appreciation that the mitochondria are not simply present in the cell to generate energy. They also serve as important signaling, sensing, and regulatory mediators. The researchers also discovered that a histone deacetylase inhibitor, a drug already approved by the FDA for cancer treatment, was able to shift these senescent cells from a large, flat shape back to a healthier, more youthful shape. The lung cells treated were also found to have improved mitochondrial function compared to their untreated counterparts. These drugs, however, have serious side effects, so the search is on to find a compound that interrupts this communication between mitochondria and the nucleus without the harsh side effects. Researchers from the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania have published data suggesting that immune cells modified using the gene editing tool CRISPR-Cas9 are able to survive and function for months following delivery to cancer patients. In this first-of-its-kind safety trial, T cells were taken from cancer patients, edited to better attack cancer cells, and returned to the patients with positive results. Coming up soon, the Longevity Leaders Congress will be held on April 21st and 22nd in London. This event will focus on the science of aging, assistive technologies, and risks relating to retirement funds. If you're attending, use our code LEAF15 for a 15% discount. Also, our friends at the Foresight Institute and 100 Plus Capital have started regular longevity salons to coordinate the growing longevity enthusiasm and onboard new investors into the space. 
For those unfamiliar, 100 plus capital invests in companies positively impacting human longevity. This can be targeted directly, such as through anti-aging companies, or more broadly, such as through clean food and water companies. The first salon will take place on March 5th in Menlo Park, California, and will feature numerous noteworthy participants. As a friend of ours, you are welcome to use the code LIFESPAN.AO for a 50% discount on the ticket price. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. <music>